All right, 708 on Monday, WGAN Morning News with Ken and Matt. And we have in studio here a special guest, Andrew Oak. He's an author, speaker, and subject matter expert for the First Ladies of the United States. He's here with a new book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with First, America's First Ladies, Volume 2. And so you were telling a, us. It's a new book, but it's a Volume 2. Right. Yeah. You're, you're telling us it's The been journey a, continues. How are you guys? Good. How are you? Updated you all the way through Melania. Doing well. Yeah. This one, Volume 2, runs from Melania. Volume 1 is the first two centuries of our country, the 1700s, 1800s. Martha Washington through Ida McKinley finishes with the assassination of McKinley. And Volume 2 opens up in the first First Lady of the 20th century, Edith Roosevelt who, strangely enough, and this kind of leads into the point of all these books, if you were naming Roosevelt, you wouldn't name Edith. No, but not. Edith Roosevelt, in 1902, changed the footprint of the White House to what we know it to be today. She created the East and West Wing. Mm. And it was so she could bring this huge, vibrant, active family in and have separate offices and a residence. She respected the place as an office, but knew that it was also a place where she was now going to have to raise her five, six children, if you include uh, Teddy Roosevelt, it'd be which, which I do because he was but just I'm a bummed. big kid. He's <laughs> a big kid. He yeah, was a big kid already. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you do you have a favorite first lady? I, you know, it's funny. I do get that question a lot. It's kind of like picking a favorite kid or a favorite mm -hmm. animal when you study these women as int intimately as I do. But I pick Lou Hoover time and time again because she's a first lady who did so much that we don't know. She spoke seven different languages, most of them self-taught. She's the only first lady to speak uh, Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, an Asian uh, language. And she taught herself this? Yes. Wow. She taught herself when she was living in China with her husband. They were mineral uh, uh, excavators and made their fortune multimillionaires before they were 30, the first administration not to take an annual salary in the position. And they'd been around the world three, four times by the time they got into the White House and just did incredible things like building schools in the mountains of, of uh, Virginia for kids that didn't have schools. They paid for it all out of their pocket, never expecting to get paid back. And they just did all these great philanthropic endeavors that never, there wasn't the big PR machine that we have now, so people just didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. The Great Depression, they're basically at the wrong place at the wrong time, mm -hmm. and history all but forgets them. Mm. You were telling us on the break that uh, when you were putting this together, it was, you know, you tried to stay and steer t away from the things that sort of we already knew about some of these right. folks. And you wanted to try to tell maybe some of the untold story about who they were when they were young and how they grew up and who they were away from their husbands. Talk yeah. about that a little bit. Well, you know, we did. And, and uh, uh, Matt brought up or, or one of you said that, that uh, uh, you know, Jacqueline Kennedy, how do you write about how do you teach people about Eleanor Roosevelt or Jacqueline Kennedy or the modern ones that we know and remember and we were alive during Jacqueline Kennedy when she was a young girl wrote poetry and wrote songs, and it's in her handwriting at the JFK Library and Museum, but she also illustrated around them. She grew up on the water and did a lot of sailing, obviously a very privileged life, but she would write these poems about the waves and the wind and the seagulls, and she'd put little starfish and sailboats. I mean, as a young kid, she's, exp she's writing these pieces, and it's just remarkable to see how different they were from everyone of the time you know they were advanced people advanced thinkers and these are the women that would hitch their wagons to these great men and become the first ladies we're talking to andrew oak he is the first ladies man nice dot com catch there. <laughs> dot com <laughs> yes yes we're about the first ladies um melania yes okay so first of all is she a russian spy <laughs> <laughs> You can tell us. I, uh, if, I, worried, if, I, if I told yes. you I'd had to kill yeah, you. No, I, that's what no. you're worried about. If you're worried about. I've been told I can't talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so mo moose and her. squirrel. No, I, 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 listen, I, I, I think the last person that wanted to be first lady was Melania Trump. Mm -hmm. um, she had her. That much is obvious. Yeah, she, had, she had her life in, in, in New York and she had her kid and all this other stuff. But I think what people are missing here is that a woman that was accused of not wanting to be first lady, albeit accurately, is embracing the role. She's doing things that other first ladies haven't done in the past, and she's not getting credit for it because her husband is so divisive and people are on you know their side of the fence. So what does but, she do? What does she do well, about other first okay, ladies? Okay, so, so when, when the hurricanes hit uh, Texas, she got blasted for wearing high heels mm -hmm. to walk out. Mm -hmm. Okay. When she stepped off the plane, she was in sneakers, mm -hmm. but what they failed to hit, what the media missed was 
during Hurricane Sandy in the Obama administration, during Rita and Katrina in the Bush administrations, those first ladies, Laura and, and Michelle, did not go to these areas. They didn't travel with their husbands. And so the point is, these first ladies don't have to do anything. There's no job description. They're not paid. They're not elected. But they're the most powerful and influential women in the world, arguably. Mm -hmm. So she is doing these things for children. She's going to these schools. She's going on trips that matter. She meets the Pope. She goes to, reads to the kids. She is embracing this role that people said that she wasn't embracing. And Michelle Obama and Laura Bush, who I love both of them equally, wildly popular, poll numbers through the roof, but they don't go to Hurricane. So let's change the, the narrative a little bit and say Melania Trump embraces a role that people said she didn't want and goes to a hurricane zone with her husband. But the question is, does she embrace her husband? That's, that, I don't, that's, I don't in, that's in volume three. I don't yeah, <laughs> yeah to, be, to, to be continued. You know, I, 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 and, I'm, and I'm not as, as interested in, in the, uh, the, the more salacious. Mm -hmm. You know, people talk about Hillary Clinton and they talk about Jacqueline Kennedy and the things that they want to know. Even Eleanor Roosevelt, there's so mm -hmm. much controversy yeah. and, and, and scandal in, in that White House and in their personal relationship. Oh. People have written those books, but I want to know what they're like as mm -hmm. the human beings and as the people that we mentioned. We are talking to Andrew Oak. He's an author and speaker and uh, talks about the First Ladies of the United States uh, with Volume 2 of On the Road with America's First Ladies. Uh, the role of the First Lady, we are just sort of highlighting there uh -huh. a moment ago, uh, certainly is is basically a blank slate i mean you're not required to do anything it's a role that's defined by the people that uh, that inhabit the quote unquote office i guess right sure uh how has that changed over the years though i mean that's obviously we've seen a defining role uh, sort of evolve just i mean i'm 37 just in front of my eyes of let course. alone people that have been following this for a long time it, it's changed as women's role in america has changed and with the individual individual as you say but as much as it's changed I think the real story here is how much it hasn't changed and how much these women have been involved from the beginning. George Washington wrote in his letters of the Revolutionary War that he basically couldn't think straight without his wife at his side. And Martha Washington would gather up her entourage and the supplies in the, in the, you know, the, the horse-drawn carriages and travel at great personal risk to nearly every winter encampment. She was an advisor. These women have served as political campaign advisors. Abigail Adams said in the second presidential election of our country, she said, if you don't remember the ladies and keep them in mind, you will not have the men on your side. She knew back then that the men are holding the remote, but the women are picking the TV shows mm -hmm. long before they could vote. These women have been so influential and so much a part of their husband's political and professional lives it's staggering and that's not what i was taught in history so as much as you know you talk about what you've been alive for and what i've been alive for and mm -hmm. what we remember i remember that when president reagan said i don't make a decision without running it by nancy he got blasted in the press for that fast forward and clinton comes along and says you get two for one so it's really the mood of the country and how much this woman wants to insert herself into this role of how much that role can change. We're talking to Andrew Oak. He's uh, the first ladies' man. Um, so we talked a little bit about Andrew Jackson's wife. Is she the saddest story of a first lady, or is there... You would think that that, that a campaign that, that caused a heart attack and your death, as it did bad. for Rachel... Yeah. Uh, Jackson would be the saddest first lady is Jane Pierce. And it's because Jane Pierce, like Rachel Jackson, wanted nothing to do with politics. But her husband got elected president kind of behind her back. He went to the Democratic convention in, in Baltimore at the time uh, to nominate someone. He came back the candidate, and then he <laughs> won. And the whole Whoops. deal was supposed to be he was stepping out of politics after being a congressman and after the Mexican-American War. And then... On their way to pick up their son at her sister's house in Andover, Massachusetts, the train axle breaks, the car rolls down a hill, and her last remaining son, Benny, is basically decapitated in front of her. And then she's got to go back to Concord, pack up the, the house, go to Washington and put on a, a bright face for the inauguration. And she had the typical morning bunting and the things up and dressed in black and things like that. And people 
got on her about it and were like, hey, smile a little bit. You're the first lady. You're not supposed to. Mm. She'd lost every single child, the last one right in front of her. Mm. So there's some there is some remarkably tragic stories, but the artifacts around these stories exist. There is a journal entry that she wrote to her dead son, Benny, in the uh, historical society in Concord. And it's it's it is remarkable to, to read these intimate feelings and and get to know these women mm. as I have. Mm. Uh, one of the ones that's interesting to me, even though I don't like the president in question here, but Woodrow uh, Wilson's wife, Edith. Oh, my gosh. That's I, mean, a that's, good I imagine that you had a fun chapter on that one. I mean, basically has a stroke and then she's stepping in. She's the be, president. She's the president. For, she is, uh, it's is, unbelievable. And, and as much even to her dying day, and she's one of these first ladies that far outlives her husband and she yeah. stays in Washington. They did not have children, so she didn't have any other place to go, really. And she loved politics. So. You're absolutely right. Woodrow Wilson has a stroke. They basically tell the country and Congress, eh, the president's fine. tired. Nothing's okay. He's yeah. going to take some time off. He's going to rest. And nothing, nothing got through that bedroom door or to the president's eyes without going past her. She made, in notation, it's all down at the, the uh, Woodrow Wilson Museum in Stanton, Virginia. You can see it. The doctor turned over all of his notes. She made political appointments in in <laughs> embassies uh, i mean it's her writing now she'll tell you it was all under the guidance and approval of the president's which may or may not be true but she did she also woodrow wilson and his doctor had planned for him to retire he's going to go into congress wheeling in his chair and go i'm out guys i've had too much i'm, I'm not in good health it says clearly in a letter from the doctor to a staffer we need to change the plan the president's plan to retire does not Please, Mrs. Wilson. She propped him up. She kept him in. The, and, and, and what she says in, in her memoirs and things was if he had given up on president, he would give up on life. And he wouldn't. And, and she said to keep him alive, to give him a purpose, he has to ride this out. And he did. And they moved into a very nice house in Washington, D.C., paid for by his contributors. Um, and and that's where he ended up dying. Mm. They both died in that house. But that's the story there. And you're joining us, First Ladies Man, firstladiesman.com. And he's got a second volume out about the First Ladies, volume two, up to Melania. So I happened to watch over the weekend Frost Nixon. And you see Pat Nixon for about three seconds yeah. in that. Pat Nixon. Oh, you know who played Pat Nixon in uh, in Nixon, the Oliver Stone one? It was uh, Joan uh, Allen. Oh, oh, she's great. Yeah. Uh, but Pat Nixon... Seemed a little Melania-like, uh, not really happy to be there. Pat Nixon, Melania Trump, best Truman. There are a lot of first ladies, going back even further, Elizabeth Monroe, that did not have the public appearance that we enjoy in a Nancy Reagan or a Hillary Clinton or a Michelle Obama. Pat Nixon did more behind the scenes than almost any other first lady. Really? She was the most traveled second lady when he was vice president and then first lady until Hillary Clinton came and beat her record. She would go unannounced and without press and without cameras to countries to spread ambassadorial well-being. She went to uh, South America after a significant um, uh, earthquake in Peru. She went to leper colonies and just went, I mean, she was in the trenches doing the work for her husband's administration, but sort of off the map kind of thing. She also, now we know Jacqueline Kennedy's efforts to to turn the place into a museum and collect all the artifacts, and she does the TV special, only first lady to win an Emmy Award for her TV special, White House tour. Her work was cut short for obvious reasons. But what people don't know, Pat Nixon picked that up and ran with that. Pat Nixon collected more historical artifacts for the White House than any other first lady to this day. Mm. So... On the out front, she was a quiet, standby sort of... What's well, I guess, so here's my question to you, to kind of follow that up. First ladies, what first ladies really hated their husbands <laughs> versus oh. the first ladies who really loved their husbands? That's coming from a divorce sh attorney. So I'm, sure, I'm sure. It's funny how you see the world in those terms. Yes, exactly. No, no, no. There, there are definitely some that, were, that, that seemed more of a power couple. Right. Um, but oh, some well of the, put. Some way, of the, way, to, way to say it like that. Some yeah. of the power couples were put together based on love, and the, the Adamses were one of right. those. Um, um, but, uh, um, you know, some would say that the, the, the um, Florence Harding, I mean, they, they had a, a bit of a rough go on it, and there was infidelity there. Uh, um, um, and when, when they started dating the Hardings, she came in and basically saved his newspaper, the Marion Star, 
uh, Warren Harding was a great, uh, uh, you know, handshaker and backsmacker. And, you know, the guy was, everyone loved him in town, but he was a horrible businessman. She was raised by a very, very hard-nosed banker father, and she knew business, and she came in, and she started working on, like, home delivery of the paper and all these innovative things that floated the newspaper financially, kept it soluble, and 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 then he went out and ran for office and had affairs and had love child and all this other stuff and one of the reporters. Well, one president has done that. I mean, well, there, unfortunately, there's a lot of you know we talk about everyone that's given the Trumps Kerber the Cleveland. grief that they are. <laughs> well, Grover Cleveland, the youngest first lady at 21. Yeah. I'm I'm the age now that Grover Cleveland was when he married 21 year old Frances Folsom. Well, it was, Can you? It was a, it was a match. different it was a love match. It was it was his law partner's daughter. Oh my God! She <laughs> first referred to him as Uncle Cleve when he bought her her first baby bassinet. Uncle Cleve. Wow. Yeah, and yeah. she was a looker too. That guy married up. Well, I mean, ran against James G. Blaine, the Continental Liar from the state of Maine. We uh, well, it, well uh, acquainted with Mr. Cleveland. Yes. But 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 it, it is interesting that that some of these are power couple things where you think that the love is not there in the marriage and that the couples aren't. Uh, you know, there's there's no there's no president to the well. Trump. Trump has been divorced before, but no president has divorced the woman he was married to as first lady yet. Uh, I mean, Frank you know. Underwood, um, real presidents, Ken. Oh, real presidents. Well, you, besides, he's not the president anymore. <laughs> Al Gore and Tipper Gore got yeah. divorced, but yeah. I mean, but that's a that's vice true. president. Yeah. That's not a thing. But these these couples do, you know, come hell or high water, or infidelity or not. Look at the Roosevelts. Mm-hmm. I mean, she had she had her Eleanor Roosevelt's girlfriend lived in the White House, and her room was closer to Eleanor's than FDR's was. And he would wheel up and down the White House saying, Eleanor, darling, where's the she-man today? I mean, that was it was it was openly known, and that's what they discussed. Oh, I've been reading this book. Jolly good time, sure. yes. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fun read. I also well, tell you where to eat in different places well, where you go and stuff. It, it's it's yeah. Well, Andrew Oaks, uh, author of the website, is firstladiesman.com. you got some events coming up here. Biddeford uh, tonight, 6.30, right? Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to Biddeford uh a Monday, Tuesday, I'm, I'm in Orono, uh, the public library there at 3 p.m. Bangor, Tuesday night uh, uh, on Harlow Street at 6.30. Uh, Wednesday, I'm in Augusta. Thursday, I'm in I'm in Top Sh- Top Sham. Topsum. 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 Got to learn me. No, got to learn me this no, local yeah. main yeah. speak. And then uh, Auburn on Friday before I, before I duck out of town. I'm here all week. Thank you for joining. It sounds like a great read. I come back any and every time, guys. Thanks. It's been a blast. Appreciate yeah. it. Well, we're, we're unfortunately out of time, so we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back on the other side. 879-9426 if you want to join us on WGAN.